new. Same old daily bunker rule. Mr. Power says he wants to see that foreign stuff as soon as it comes in. Don't declare war for a few minutes. According to a high official, it is believed our foreign correspondent. I could get more news out of Europe looking in the crystal ball. That uh, Stebbin cable has a morsel in it? Stebbins makes me sick. They all make me sick. Europe about to blow up and all I can get out of my foreign staff is a daily guessing game. I want some facts, Mr. Bradley. For instance? Any kind of facts. There must be something going on in Europe beside a nervous breakdown. Uh, why not try sending me over, Mr. Powers? You've written a book on economics or something. The uh, Twilight of Feudalism? Yes, it was very well received. Not by me. I don't want any more economists, sages, or oracles bombinating over our cables. I want a reporter. Somebody who doesn't know the difference between a nism and a kangaroo. A good, honest crime reporter. That's what the globe needs. That's what Europe needs. There's a crime hatching on that bedeviled continent. Wait a minute. I've got something that might pass for an idea. Who was that fellow that ran down the payroll robbery last week? Oh, you mean Johnny Jones? He beat up a policeman, didn't he? In the line of duty? Yes, there's some talk at the city desk of firing him. Hmm. Beat up a policeman, eh? Sounds ideal for Europe. Send Mr. Jones up here right away. Mr. Powers wants to see you, Mr. Jones. Oh, he does, huh? You should come to his office right away. What about? Well, I ain't in his confidence. Well, look, you tell him to save his breath. Tell him I've resigned. Well, I'm supposed to bring you there. OK. I lie open this. Where's Mr. Jones? I told you to send him right up here. Are you Mr. Jones? Yes. Sit down, please. Oh. You mind a personal question? No. Are you married? No luck. Single, eh? Ever been in Europe? No. What's your opinion of the present European crisis, Mr. Jones? What crisis? I'm referring to the impending war, Mr. Jones. Oh, that? Yeah. Well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Powers, I haven't given it much thought. Oh. You don't keep up with our foreign news, do you, Mr. Jones? Now, look, Mr. Powers, if you're going to fire me, you can scrap the intelligence test. It's perfectly OK with me. I can get a job on any other newspaper in town within an hour. So long. Wait a minute. Nobody fired you. Huh? How would you like to cover the biggest story in the world today? Give me an expense account, and I'll cover anything. I'll give you an expense account. OK, what's the story? Europe. Well, I'm afraid I'm not exactly equipped, sir, but I could do some reading up. No, no, no reading up. I like you just as you are, Mr. Jones. What Europe needs is a fresh, unused mind. Foreign correspondent, eh? No, a reporter. I don't want correspondent. I want news. You think you could dig up some news in Europe? I'd be very happy to try, sir. Now, this is what I mean. Mr. Van Meer, when questioned by our oracle, Mr. Stebbins, refused to open his mouth. 1,200 words, cable told, to the fact that the great Van Meer had nothing to say. Do you know what that kind of stuff is doing? It's driving our readers crazy with frustration. Who's Van Meer? Keynote to the European situation today. Listen, Jones, if Van Meer stays at the helm of his country's affairs for the next three months, it may mean peace in Europe. If we knew what he was thinking, we'd know where Europe stands. In German, eh? No. Holland Strongman, one of the two signers of the Dutch treaty with Belgians. Now, this is your first assignment. I want you to talk with him, find out what's in that treaty and what he thinks is going to happen. Facts. Van Meer, eh? Right. Anybody else? No. Well, how about Hitler? Don't you think it'd be a good idea to pump him? He must have something on his mind. Yes? Mr. Stephen Fisher to see you, Mr. Powers. Tell him come in. Did you ever hear of Stephen Fisher? I'm afraid he's not on my beat. Well, he is from now on. He's head of the Universal Peace Party and very close to Van Meer. They're both working to prevent Europe going up in flames. Oh. How do you do, Mr. Fisher? Oh, nice yeah. of you to come over. Sit yeah. down. Thank you. Mr. Fisher, Mr. Jones, our new foreign correspondent. 
I want you to know each other. How do you do, Mr. Jones? Jones. I don't like that name. It's going to handicap you, young man. Now, wait a minute. I've got some sort of a name here. Yes, Haverstock. Huntley Haverstock. Sounds a little more important, don't you think, Mr. Fisher? Oh, yes, yes, very dashing, too. Mm. It sounds better than Richard Harding Davis. Richard Harding Davis wasn't over there. Oh, we can't use that. That's the name of one of our greatest war correspondents 40 years ago. Well, speak up, young man. You don't mind being Huntley Haverstock, do you? Uh, rose by any name, sir. It's really very exciting being present at the christening of an American newspaper correspondent. Shouldn't we break a bottle of champagne or something over him? <laughs> you should break one over my head to see if I'm still awake. Huntley Haverstock. Well, Mr. Haverstock, you better get started. You've got a lot to do. Passports, photos, visas. Expenses. Oh, I'll send a note to the cashier. I hope you brought your Sunday articles over. Yes, I managed three of them. See you in London then, Mr. Haverstock. Oh, yes, of course. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Thank you for everything. Except Huntley Haverstock. <laughs> Of this, Mother. <laughs> How's it look, she? Well, don't wear it over one eye like that. It makes you look like a gangster. Oh, Mother, you always think the boys are wearing their hats over one eye. Let him wear it the way it is. He'll have to wear a stovepipe when he gets to London. They call them poppers over there. Toppers, Uncle Bjorn. Well, Bobby, me boy, put that in the box for Uncle John, will you? Let me try it on. No, I'm trying to sit. Now he's a regular war correspondent. Without a war. Oh, I'm afraid he'll get his war all right. Oh, they're all throwing a big bluff over there. Let's hope so. Well, Mother, how do you like the way we have our little nest furnished? Well, if I were you, I'd hang lighter curtains, and I think I'd move that soap out in the middle of the floor. <laughs> it's too bad you haven't an open fireplace. Well, now, if you'd speak to the captain, I think he'd tend to everything. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Stebbins, London man for the Globe. Oh, yes, Mr. Powers told me you'd probably be here. Darn nice for you to come. That reminds me, I lost mine on the way over. I can say your other name, too, that uh, Huntley Tavis. Well, could say it yesterday, but I had a rather tough session with the boys last night. So I'll stick to Jones, if you don't mind. Well, Jones is great with me. Let's get out of here. This crowd's making me nervous. Yeah, I guess my nerves aren't in the pink this morning. Well, you just take it easy, Mr. Stebbins. I'll follow you yeah, right along. Too. Porter, bring those bags and don't bang them into my knees from behind, either. Hey, what about a drink after that long train ride? Well, that sounds like a very logical idea. Well, I may not act it, but I've been here 25 years. 25 years, London man for the Globe, and they haven't caught on to me yet. How did you manage it? <laughs> All you do is cable back the government handouts and sign them, our London correspondent. Now, uh, what's yours? I'll have a scotch and soda, please. Miss. Uh, oh, Miss. Oh, Miss, please. Uh, scotch and soda and a glass of milk. A glass of milk? Yeah, I'm on the wagon. I went to the doctor today to see about these jitters I got, and he said it was the wagon for a month or a whole new set of organs. I can't afford a whole new set of organs. So. Well, if I'd known you were on the wagon, I could have got along all right without this, but as long as it's here, good luck. Good? Yeah, this is just like any other scotch and soda. That's what I thought. Doesn't taste the way it did when I was a baby. I've got poison in it. Speaking of poison, I got some pills I gotta take. Oh, here's some cables that have been coming over from New York. They love to cable from New York. It makes them think that you're working for them. There's an invitation to that lunch for the Dutchman Van Meer tomorrow. I guess that's your dish. Oh, this is given by the Universal Peace Party. That's Fisher's organization, isn't it? I don't know. I don't follow those things very much. New York wants it, I send it. That's the secret of being a correspondent. Been doing it 25 years. 25 years, and I end up on milk. Oh, good morning. 
Morning. How's the water wagon? Look at that. One of them shook off this morning. <laughs> Oh, well, I, I'm just on my way to the Van Meer luncheon. Oh, I gotta have lunch here with old man Clark. He's the international press pick. Oh, here you are, darling. I didn't know whether to meet you in the grill or upstairs. Oh. Goodbye, Stephens. Goodbye, Miss uh, Clark. Who is he calling Clark? He's got his nerve. Oh, some fresh American reporter. Good morning, Mr. Van Meer. I beg your pardon, sir. You are Mr. Van Meer, aren't you? That's my name, yes. Well, my name's Haverstock. You don't know me. I'm an American. I just happen to be on my way to your luncheon. Oh? Well, then perhaps... Well, that's very kind of you, sir. Come, come, come. It's all in a good cause. Savoy Hotel. Well, this is very kind of you, Mr. Van Meer. It's a pleasure, my boy. I dislike riding alone. One thinks too much while riding alone. Yes, exactly. The Polish situation and the Dutch treaty with the Belgians must be on your mind quite a lot these days. Uh, what do you feel, Mr. Van Meer, that England will do in case the Nazis... Uh... England is so beautiful. It's nice to see London in the sunshine. Always there are some lots of rain, a fog. Also, it is August. Yes, I found out it was August. That was pretty good for me. But uh, would you mind telling me how you feel about Mr. Fisher and his peace organization. Oh, you, Do you know Mr. Chance? Fisher? Oh, a very fine man. Mm. A good man. I wish there were more like him in the world just now. Well, then I take it you don't think there's much hope for peace. I mean that uh, you don't think that one little peace organization can make much headway against the European war panic. I would like to think so. Oh, look at those birds. No matter how big the city, there must always be parks and places for the birds to live. I was walking through the park this morning and I saw several people feeding the birds. It's a good sign at a time like this, is it not? Yes, it's a dandy sign, but I do think that right now the birds are the least of our problems. Your country, for instance, what might be its attitude toward the... Oh, we're now near the Savoy. How much? Shilling. That's right. By the way, young man, what newspaper do you represent? Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Van Meer, I'm not exactly a reporter, but I was trying to get you to talk. I didn't want bird talk either. Yeah, I gather that. <laughs> and just what was it that you were trying to get me to tell you? Well, to be perfectly frank, I was trying to find out what you know about the possibility of a general war. How do you really feel about it? My boy, I feel very old and sad. And helpless. I did have one. The last use from Poland was very alarming. Nobody wants war, and yet... Then we don't have to have it, do we? But you must understand, Miss Fisher, that often circumstances over which we have no control... Oh, yes, those very convenient circumstances over which we have no control. It always seems odd, but they usually bring on war. You never hear of circumstances over which we have no control rushing us into peace, do you? <laughs> <laughs> very determined woman, my daughter. Come on, let's go and see if you can pick a fight somewhere else. Excuse us. Good for you. Wasn't he a bore? So many worthy people are, my dear. Bless them. How do you do? How do you like to be fishing in Ireland at this oh. minute? Awful pace we're going. Haven't had a good sailor swim together in months. Not even a game of cribbage. Miss them? Up anchor mate. There's the Admiral. He has a weakness for you. Go on, do your stuff. Ah, oh, here you are. The Jones that became a Haverstock. Have a good trip across? I still wish we were Richard Harding Davis. So do I, sir. Anything except... Uh... Hello. 
Oh, hello. I want you to meet Mrs. Appleby. Mrs. Appleby, this is Mr. Huntley Haverstock, special correspondent in New York Globe. Foreign correspondent? Not really. Cross my heart. Oh, but you look such a dear, sweet boy. You don't seem a bit like the others. You know, they say. Oh, no. Ah, uh, but I'm sure you're marvelous at it. I wonder if you know a friend of mine, Monty Rockingham. He's in the embassy at Istanbul. Or is it Honolulu? Do help me with this distinguished-looking gentleman over here. I can't make any headway with him at all, but I'm sure he must speak some language. Everybody does. I have the least idea who he is, but there isn't anybody here who isn't internationally important. This is Mr. Haver. Uh, Stark. My name is in Prechtil, Pjungs. And as more lapis, me are all representatives. No English? Who parlez français? Try German. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Splendid. What else do you know? Well, only Pig Latin. Pig Latin? Oh, here we are. This will do it. Ah, light mm, Well, now we're getting somewhere. The universal language. Dear Maharaja. <laughs> ah, Cayunis Clair. Cayunis Clair, President Lopian. Igus, I shall lap Skaista. Well, hell, they come in pairs. Uh, if you speak English, will you give me a hand with the laughing Latvian? What's his racket? What's he talking? Latvian? No kidding. I didn't know the lads had a language. I thought they just rubbed noses. You mean you actually speak Latvian? Oh, just enough to get about. Oh, what does just enough to get about consist of in Latvia? Well, I don't think you'd have any trouble. It'd be a comfort to know when I get to Latvia. Oh, you think there might be a chance of your getting to Latvia soon? Mm, you never can tell in my record. I suppose you guessed I'm a foreign correspondent. Are you? That's nice. I uh, see you're taking notes. Are you covering this affair, too? Well, I sort of work here. Oh, publicity. Well, you're just the one I'm looking for. We've got to go in a secret conference right away. Oh. Uh, <laughs> me? Excuse me. I beg your pardon, sir, but I have a Latvian friend here who's particularly interested in the origin of the kilt. I wonder if you'd be interested in talking to him. He's a lovely fellow. It's a most amazing story. You see, the Greeks in the early period, they used to wear a, a kilt. Now, what is this big secret conference all about? Well, it's no secret as far as I'm concerned. However, I'll let you in on that part of it later. But since you're handling the publicity for this outfit, you might give me a line on what it's all about. I mean, this league for peace and understanding. Well, just what is it you'd like to know? Well, in the first place, is this Mr. Fisher entirely on the level? Very much so. Well, he seems like a very nice guy. He is, I assure you. Well, what is it that makes him or you think that an organization like this, made up of well-meaning amateurs, buck up against those tough military boys of Europe? Well, it's the well-meaning amateurs, as you call them, who go out and do the fighting when the war comes, isn't it? Luncheon is served. Oh, oh, please don't go yet. You don't want any of those dreary chicken patties. Well, I'm sorry. I must go. Well, but then sit at the press table with me. Nobody ever listens to the speeches at the press table, and we could talk. After all, you don't even know my name yet. Well, is it necessary? Well, it is to me. I don't mind if you hear it's Huntley Haverstock, because it's really Jones. What's yours? Mine's really Smith. Don't mind if you hear it's anything else. Waiter. Yes, sir. Uh, same young lady. Try again. I have taken a young lady 13 notes, sir. She won't accept any more. <laughs> My lords, ladies and gentlemen, pray silence for your chairman, Mr. Stephen Fisher. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an announcement to make which I'm sure will be a great disappointment to us all. I've just received this telegram from Mr. Van Meer, who was to have been our guest of honor today. Deeply regret called away suddenly owing to unforeseen circumstances, and I will be unable to attend your meeting as planned. I am with you and your work with all my heart. I could not have said more had I been there. Although this removes one of our star attractions at the luncheon, we may as a result have more time to tell you from the inside just what this party has stood for and why we've asked you here today. And I can think of no one more competent to do this than the speaker I'm about to introduce. I trust you will not think this is a family affair when I say that I refer to my daughter, Miss Carol Fisher. Lords, ladies and gentlemen, 
Pray silence for Miss Carol Fisher. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I trust that even making allowances for a father's exuberance, you do not think that I'm in any way being put forward today as a substitute for Mr. Van Meer. Unhappily for us, no one can take Mr. Van Meer's place. What I can do, possibly, is to clear up a few misapprehensions that seem to have crept into the public discussion of this movement and revise some of the epithets that have been applied to us by some who have not gone as deeply into the matter as they might. For example... The male of the speeches is I've better heard than the male. Shh. ...as a group of well-meaning amateurs. Now, I'm sure there's some of you here today who think of us as such. And I should like to ask anyone who has called us well-meaning amateurs to stand up by his chair and tell me just why a well-meaning amateur is any less reliable than a well-meaning professional at a moment like this. But I'll not take the time. I think the world has been run long enough by the well-meaning professional. We might give the amateurs a chance now. But what I really want to do is to give you a very brief idea of just... just how far-reaching I amateur plans are. Use your notes. Yeah. And uh, just why we ask for your support, professional or amateur. What I mean to say is that however much one may... I mean, we should both... both of us... When did you get over? Uh, just now. I had a cable from Mr. Powers. The conference is my first assignment. Well, an ironic assignment for your first one. A peace conference, the shadow of war. You mean it's really coming? Today and tomorrow will tell. There's still hope for us. I'm going back to London today. Leaving for London? Well, I only just got here. I mean, the conference is just beginning. I think that today and tomorrow the work for peace must be done in London rather than Amsterdam. Well, are you taking your whole staff back to London with you? I mean, even including your... Oh, no, no. I have someone staying here to look after and see you're given all the help you need. You'll be in very good hands. Ah, here she is. Mrs. Appleby, Mr. Haverstock. Of course, he met us at luncheon. You remember Mr. Pissetittle, don't you? Oh. He's awfully nice, but I still can't understand him. Dr. Williamson, this is Mr. Huntley Haverstock, who represents the New York Globe. He's a little unfamiliar with Amsterdam and the machinery of peace meetings. Would you be so good as to take him under your wing? Perhaps you or Mrs. Appleby might see that he samples eight or ten varieties of Dutch cheese at dinner tonight. Mm. And now, if you'll excuse me, I must see what unlucky first is going to give up his seat to me on that London train. Mm. Don't get into any mischief, will you? Mischief. Your first visit to Amsterdam? Uh, yes. Well, then you must let me take you to Rembrandt's house, and of course, that you'd feel the... Might be a good idea if you went over the agenda of the conference, Mr. Haverstock. Well, well, no. If you'll excuse me, I think I see a friend. Mr. Van Meer, how are you? We somehow seemed to lose each other the day before yesterday. I'm so sorry you were called away. Well, don't you remember me? We shared the same cab together on the way to the luncheon. Excuse me. May I have your picture, Mr. Van Meer? Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
shoving your knees out of the way. You got Miss Fisher? Yes, isn't he? Are you two know each other? Oh, I forgot. This is Scott Follett. Newspaper man, same as you. London correspondent. Mr. Heverstock, Mr. Follett. With the double F. How do you do? How do you do? I don't get the double F. It's the beginning, old boy, and they're both small Fs. It can't be at the beginning. One of my ancestors had his head chopped off by Henry VIII, and his wife dropped the capital a letter to commemorate the occasion. There it is. Now, you say it like a stutter? No, no, just straight for. That's the most amazing disappearing trick I've ever seen. You don't suppose they could have got up that high, do you? Where is the wagon to come? Spanish? Tom Blackie, Fifteen. Between it? Well, take a look for yourself, old boy. Look, tell him your name. Tell him about the two small Fs. That'd be a bit over his head, up. Los forward! Well, this isn't catching any assassins. We should have kept one of those policemen and played bridge. Yeah, I guess you're right. Oh. <laughs> I'll bet two to one on the derby. <laughs> sails on that windmill. You get used to those when you've been in Holland longer. Well, I could have sworn they were going against the wind just now. Why don't you lie down on the wet grass and cool off, old boy? I'll cool off in due time, but first I want you to do me a favor. I want you to get the police back here. The police again? We don't want the police. I've decided not to prosecute. No, no, Scott, listen. You'll get the police, because our man's in there. In where? In that mill. Well, what makes you think so? Look, a lot of things can happen while I'm explaining. Will you please take my word for it and get the police? I'd go myself if I spoke the language. Well, what'll you do? I'm going to do a little bit of snooping. I hate to seem executive, but this is serious. Come on, Scott. Oh, all right, you shall have your cookies.
Christ, how that's supposed to be. Okay. I've just been given a drug. Drug of some sort. But I saw you shot just now outside the conference hall. I saw it. They gave it to me when they moved me from... Ah, oh, it's beginning now. But the man I saw shot was a dead image. The man you saw shot, that wasn't me. He was a substance. Substitutes that looked like me. But why? What? They, they want the world to think that I have been assassinated. Yes. To conceal the fact that I have their hands. Their hands? Who are they? I can't explain. I'm not certain. Oh, this drug. I can hardly think. All that I can tell you is that they are going to take me away by plane, oh, like a bird. <laughs> Always have places in the city where birds can get crumbs. I have a 
laten we het hopen. Vliegtuigen zijn niet bepaald geschikt voor worstelwedstrijden. Met dit in Ola. Understand? Well, does anyone here speak English? English? We speak English in the school. Well, honey, why you been holding out on me? Look, tell these two policemen to come with me. Very, very important. Big old prisoner, old Mill. Tell them to follow me. Do you understand? Hi, Sector. Who met him? Me met Don. And who man wart in the molen gay fangin gay hooden? Yeah. Hi, Sector. Hi, work next for room. Bar had his best lesson in Sackalik. That who met him, Migar. Both be him all speedily. Yeah, that's what I've been trying to tell you. Come on. Thank you. Can I have a word for They've gone. Killed him. But it isn't. Who are you? Well, where are the others? There is niemand here for half an hour's welfare. There's been a frame up. Ask him where the others have gone. Was under under and not took it gone. Made by your vapor. Sanfidam. He says he doesn't know what you're talking about. There are no other people. And in any case, he's been asleep here all day. He's lying. I talked to Van Meer in this very room. Well, there's one thing I can show you. The assassin's car, the one we followed. The modern is very in the shoe. Oh, love the car.
rather a unique specimen, old boy. The only one horsepower car in the world. I don't care what you say. That car was here. Listen, I know I look a fool, but there's something fishy going on around here. There's a big story in this. I can smell it. I can feel it. And I'm going to get to the bottom of it. It's the last thing I do. And nothing's going to stop me, do you understand? I'm going to prove that that was not Van Meer that was assassinated, but his double. <laughs> Detective, you weren't announced. I'm sorry, sir. We we asked at the desk. Policeman, huh? Well, then don't tell me you're here to apologize about the windmill. No, sir. We simply want you to come with us, if you will, and tell your story to our chief of police here. Well, now let me get this straight. Does this chief of police speak English? Because I'm a very busy man. It will take no more than half an hour, sir. We all speak English. All speak English? Well, that's marvelous. That's more than I can say for my country. Look, would you sit down for just a moment? I have to make a phone call. Dinner date for the young lady. Exchange doesn't answer. Well, I'll call later. Look, I'm a very quick bather. Would you excuse me just a minute while I jump in and out of the tub and give myself a quick shave? Just look at some magazines there. I'll be right back. Uh, you couldn't bring the chief police here, could you? No, I am afraid not. No, I thought not. Don't bother to come. Well, you'll find it on my dressing table. Oh. Well, we meet again. So it seems. I uh, quite a lot's happened since I last saw you. So I see. I uh, had quite a chase after that guy outside Amsterdam. It's quite a country, you know. It's interesting. There are windmills and tulips. Did you find everything you... We were just talking about the tulips. Don't seem to be any. I really think I should be going now. Thank you very much for the powder. Oh, well, uh, must you really go now? Yes, I must be going now, really. Goodbye. Well, you've made quite a day of it, haven't you? Made now, monkeys out of Scott Foley and me in front of the local police, uh, broken into my bedroom and disgraced me before a very important friend of my no, father's. What are your plans now, may I ask? I'll tell you if you, you wait. You might just... at least have had your clothes Take on. it easy, take it easy. This is serious business. I've got to talk to you. I've seen your serious business before. What are you doing in my bedroom? I'm escaping. Escaping? Escaping from what? From a couple of fellas in my room about to kill me. Oh, they are. May I ask who? Two gentlemen disguised as policemen waiting to take me for a ride. Mr. Haverstock, don't you think you've been talking through your hat long enough? But I'm not talking through my hat. I've thrown a monkey wrench into some international dirty business, whatever it is. I know Van Meer's alive. That's the reason they want to kill me. I can think of others. Now, look, you've got to help me, not for my sake alone, but this is the biggest story in Europe. Look, your childish mind is as out of place in Europe as you are in my bedroom. 
Get over there. Es bei dur mein Boscha hier. Ah, kajun es klaja. Man lūt jesnīs naru. Lūsu pīdor dat man, ha? You see what you're doing, don't you? All this is going straight back to London and will be common gossip by tomorrow. I don't care for myself, but my father's engaged in a great work. He's trying to help avert a war, a dreadful war, and this is just the sort of thing to discredit him. I know you care nothing about our work. All you're interested in is having fun with windmills and hotel bathrooms. I take it you don't believe I'm in trouble. You'll be in plenty of trouble if you don't get out of here. Now, for the last time, please go. Okay. But I want you to know exactly what's going to happen when I do go. I'll go back to my room and get dressed. I'll try and shake those two fellows off, but I won't succeed. They'll stick to me like a couple of tattoo marks until they get me. They'll stop at nothing. I seem to know too much, and they're right. I don't know the ins and outs of your crackpot peace movement. I don't know what's wrong with Europe, but I do know a story when I see one. And I'll keep after it until either I get it or it gets me. Sorry you have those derogatory opinions of me, but I guess that can't be helped. Well, so long. It's been nice knowing you. I said goodbye. Don't go. Oh, well, I guess I could have handled those fellows all right with a little luck. Oh, but we mustn't take any chances. We should get some help. Well, that's what I had in mind at first. I'll get Dr. Williamson and Mr. Van Stuyven. No, no, not with me this way. They might not understand. They have understood. the night roll back to England and see Father if you could only get out. You could only get out. That's the hitch, all right. Say, what's that friend of yours name? That F.F. Foliot. Something? Uh, give me Mr. Foliot's room, please. Left the hotel? Well, that's strange. We were to dine together tonight. But well, obviously you realized how much I meant to you. You'd mean much more to me with your clothes on. No, you like the intellectual type. I like the Say, type. I've got an idea. Oh. Give me the manager, please. Bus for the valley, will you? Hello, is this the manager? Well, this is Mr. Haverstock in 537. Say, what kind of a hotel is this? My bathtub leaks, my phone's out of order, and I've been robbed. Well, will you send somebody up right away? Thank you. Operator, operator, send a waiter up to 537. That's right, and ask the chambermaid to bring up some clean sheets. I've set mine on fire. And I'd like my windows cleaned, the window cleaner right away. And ask Boots to come up and get my shoes, too, will you? And hurry it up. That's a good girl. Potter up that room nicely for those two guys. Yes, sir. It's a valley. Come in. Do you speak English? Yes, sir. Well, look, go to my room 537. 537. And get me a shirt, tie, suit, and a hat. You see, my husband's waiting in the room for this gentleman. <laughs> Wie geht's dir denn? Was machen Sie denn hier? Wie kommt's denn hier? Ja, wir hatten das ja gerade nicht mehr los hier. Wie kommt Sie denn aus? Wie hat der Wasser gekommen da rein? Das geht's doch doch. Da haben Sie denn was in der Hand? Das ist doch mal ein bisschen Freude, Leute. Das geht doch. Das ist doch ein bisschen Freude. Das ist doch ein bisschen Freude. Haben Sie denn was damit zu tun? Absolut nicht. Das verstehe ich aber doch nicht. Hello. 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 No sign of them yet. Come on, let's hide ourselves in the cabin. Full up, sir. Sorry. Not even a small cabin? Not a thing. You see how it is, sir? Everybody in a hurry to get home. I see. Well, I have a rather rare banknote here, which you might be interested in. It's a memento. That is, if you collect rare banknotes at all. It's no use, sir. I'd do it if I could, but there just isn't a place left. 
Once aboard an English ship, you come up against such an air of incorruptibility. Uh, as a matter of fact, sir, I just had a cabin returned. Can I have your name, sir? Oh. <clears throat> but one cabin isn't going to do as much good as if we just go. Oh, well, I fully intended to sleep in the lounge. I hope you didn't think that I... No, of course not. It's very kind of you. Oh, that's fine. Uh, <clears throat> I'll take it. I'm sorry, sir. I'm afraid it's too late now. You seem to have some doubt about taking it, so I have to let that gentleman have it. Oh, that's too bad. It's such a rare five-pound note, too. You see, the watermark's upside down. I think you'd have loved it. Well, perhaps next time. charge all my traveling expenses to the office, corrupting an official, five pounds. You're just a wee bit unscrupulous, aren't you? No, unscrupulous. Just in love. It's the same thing, I suppose. I beg your pardon? I beg yours. You see, I love you and I want to marry you. I love you and I want to marry you. Well, that's our love scene down quite a bit, doesn't it? Do you mind? Not at all. It's made a new man of me. Well, I hope not entirely new. It took me some time to get used to the first man you were. <laughs> to be perfectly frank with you, I expected a little more argument. And I'm really left with quite a few things I wanted very much to say. Well, save them until after we're married. I imagine they'll sound much better then. Oh, I'd saved some things to say then, too. Oh, you were really quite sure of yourself, weren't you? It's a funny thing that I didn't think I had a chance. A guy's got a right to dream, though, hasn't he? Evidently. Do you think your father will understand? I think the father will be delighted, frankly. Miss Carroll. Good morning, Stiles. This is Mr. Haverstock. Is Father up yet? Yes, Miss. He's having breakfast. Come on. Hello, Father. Well, Carol, what on earth are you doing in London? Well, jo uh, Mr. Haverstock brought me back on the boat. Nothing wrong, is there? You're not ill or anything. You look perfectly healthy. No, I'm fine. It's Mr. Haverstock. I hope you don't mind my barging in like this. On the contrary, I'm delighted to see you. You cover a lot of territory, don't you? You didn't even send me a wire. Just for that, I hope your trip was perfectly uncomfortable. Oh, it wasn't so bad. The boat was terribly crowded. We couldn't get any cabins, but we managed to sleep on the deck. Well, Monsieur Krug, how nice to see you again. Uh, but you haven't met Mr. Haverstock, Monsieur Krug. Monsieur Krug is a member of the Bohemian Embassy staff here. Sit down, Mr. Haverstock. Have a spot of breakfast. Style. I know I should tidy up, but I'm simply starved. So you were in Amsterdam yesterday, Mr. Haverstock. Oh, Van Meer. I count his death a heavy personal loss. Of all people, why Van Meer? You can't ask why of an assassin. There's no logic in killing. We can't spare such men in a world like ours. Did you by any chance meet him, Mr. Haverstock? Not formally, but I saw him die. Horrible. As a matter of fact, I chased the man that shot him and almost caught him. Mr. Haverstock is a newspaper man, Mr. Krug. That would have been quite a coup, bringing in your first story wrapped around an assassin. I think I shall have to be getting along now, Mr. Fisher. Shall we settle on the wording for the peace petition now or leave it till later? We may as well clear it up straight away in the study. You'll excuse us? Father, could I speak to you for a moment? It's terribly important. Yes, of course, dear. This won't take a moment, though. Meanwhile, see if you can't interest Mr. Haverstock in some eggs and bacon. Mr. Fisher, what's that man doing here? Why, it's Mr. Krug. Van Meer isn't dead. Not just me. That was his double that was shot. Van Meer himself was kidnapped. I talked to him in a mill outside Amsterdam. Well, what has Monsieur Krug to do with it? Remember my description of the man in the mill? You mean the sweater? Of course. 
Oh, but that's impossible. We've known Monsieur Kruger. Ever I seen. tell you, Mr. Kruger brought Van Meer here by plane last night. He's in England now. They're hiding him. Positive about this? Why, of course I am. I was as close to Kruger as I am to you right now. It would have been terrible if we made a mistake. On the other hand, we can't allow him to. Fisher! Leave it to me. I don't want to seem inhospitable, Krug, but I must ask you to leave my house. I'm sure that Mr. Haverstock is going to suggest that I turn you over to the police. Mr. Haverstock seems to be something of a troublemaker. I thought you said he'd been taken care of by our agents in Amsterdam. I thought so, too. I don't understand. Unless, perhaps, Miss Fisher's being with him may have caused complications. It would have been ideal if she had been in our confidence. Please leave my daughter out of it. I beg your pardon. Most unfortunate is coming here. I've never had to cope with this sort of thing before. Thanks to you, Krug. Someone has to take care of the sordid details. But this is close to home. In fact, it is my home. After all, I'm only a politician, in a sense. And politicians aren't usually called upon to um, do away with their guests, are they? Quiet, boy, quiet. Not in the house, no, sir. But I have an idea. Do you remember Roly? Roly? Oh, yes, the little man who used to work at your father's tables in Austria. Yes, I seem to recall he was present when a mutual friend of ours um, accidentally fell off the high bridge at Bern. He's retired now. Lives somewhere in Clapham here in London. If Mr. Haverstack could be induced to hire him in the capacity of a private detective. What for? You should warn him that it is very dangerous for him to go about London with the knowledge that he has. Oh, yes, I see, yes. You use the English language with great delicacy, Krug. Thank you, sir. I should look Mr. Rowley up at once and give him his instructions. But you mustn't. It would be too dangerous. What do we do now? Call Scotland Yard? I thought it best to send Monsieur Krug on his way. You let him get away? Well, listen. Well, just a minute. If what you say is true, don't you see how important it is not to rouse Crew's suspicions? That male will be killed immediately. Dead or alive, it's a story. Well, Johnny Felder's right. Okay, I'll cable him what I've got, then. I wouldn't if I were you. Van Meer's life may depend upon our keeping this quiet for a few hours at least. Keep it quiet? A famous diplomat's kidnapped right under my own eyes and I muzzle myself? I'm sorry, Mr. Fisher, but this is a story with facts in it. This is the kind of story I was sent over here to get. This is the kind America's waiting for. It'll be a bigger story if you can wait just for a few hours until we can find Van Meer and discover what's behind this whole curious business. I know what's behind it. I don't mean who's behind it. I mean the why of it. Dear, will you um, get me all my correspondence with crew? Please, Johnny, do what Father says. It'll be best for you and poor Mr. Van Meer. Okay. I'll wait. I'm worried about you, Mr. Haverstock. Yeah, I'm a little worried about myself. I feel weak-minded. Oh, you're doing the right thing, but I don't like you dashing about like this without some kind of protection. Oh, forget it. But what you say is true. You need protection. Listen, Mr. Fisher, I've covered beer mob killings and race riots since I was a tot without even carrying a rabbit's foot. These people are criminals, more dangerous than your rum runners and housebreakers. They're fanatics. They combine a mad love of country with an equally mad indifference to life, their own as well as others. They are cunning, unscrupulous and inspired. <laughs> and I really couldn't face Mr. Powers again if you didn't live long enough to turn in the best story of the year. I'm going to be a fine foreign correspondent hiding in an attic somewhere. I'm not suggesting you hide anywhere. Just get somebody to watch out for you. A nurse, huh? Johnny Jones goes to Europe and hires a nurse. That's going to look great on the expense account. <laughs> no. No, I know a very efficient private detective agency where we can get just the man. Okay, whatever you say. I can arrange it all for you. And if it'll make you feel any better, I won't mention it to anybody. Mention it? Listen, if anyone finds out I've hired a bodyguard, I'll shoot myself. If that's Mr. Rowley, tell him to wait outside. Yes, sir. I've called him Mr. Raverstock. Will you tell him Mr. Rowley is here? Yes. Will you wait here, please? Thank you. Mr. Haverstock, your cab's here. Oh. Where are you going? I'm going down to the office. I've got work to do. Oh, but Johnny, you mustn't go. Well, look, I was sent over here at great expense as a newspaper man, not a refugee. How about lunch at the Savoy? I'll see you out. 
Johnny, please be careful. I'll be all right. Mr. Ragostock? Say, is this the man? Look, who's protecting who? Well, I ain't lanky, sir, but I'm quick. I take it you understand exactly what you have to do. Yes, sir, you can trust me to take good care of Mr. Everstock. Are we going now, sir? Yes, you can take me down to my office in Fleet Street, and if you're good, you can run me to the American Club. Right, sir. Uh, you keep after this other thing. Well, of course, as soon as there's any definite news of our friend, I'll let you know, then you can break the story. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. <laughs> Why, Carol? Nothing must happen to him, Father. I just couldn't. How do we go, sir? Would you like me to walk a little way behind you? Or beside you, like a friend? Well, what's the custom? Well, different people have different tastes, sir. When I was with the Duke of Albatross, the Duke being a democratic sort of gent, I used to walk alongside of him, man to man like. On the other end, I once had a lady who thought that was disrespectful. Three paces behind, she says, and don't smoke on duty. <laughs> well, what's good enough for a duke's good enough for me. We uh, might work it as a team. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, if we want to go to the American club, so we'd better take a cab. Aye. Here's a... Here, there's one. What's the trouble, sir? Is it gangsters after? Mm, not exactly. Oh, well, we're not afraid of gangsters over here, you know, sir. Well, even our police don't carry guns. What do they do, then? If you're over the head with a stick. A bit more healthy like you can tell what I mean. Did you see that? Someone deliberately pushed me. Well, that was me, sir. If I'd have pulled your back, you'd have been caught. It was push or nothing. Well, that's smart work, Mr. Rowley. Thank you very much. Oh, after all, that's what I'm here for, isn't it, eh? Taxi! American Club. Not certain, sir. Well, we've got an idea. Two men just got in another cab to follow us. I don't see anyone suspicious. Well, I may have been mistaken, but I'm almost certain I saw them. They may have heard where we're going. Driver. Driver! Go down Victoria Street, round past Buckingham Palace. Right, sir. We might give them the slip if we go the long way around. I'm afraid they're still after us, sir. Our best plan is to pull around the next corner and change cabs. Driver, take the first to your left and pull up. We're going to walk a bit. I'll do it, sir. I understand the money. It'll be quicker. Thank you, sir. I think our best plan is to slip into the cathedral for a bit. Well, let's call off this ducking out of sight. Let him catch up with us and have a showdown. No, I wouldn't cause a scene, sir, if I were you. Our job is to give him the slip. All right, let's go. Nice bit of architecture, sir. In, sir. I saw with a notice it was a requiem mass. You know, a mass for the dead. That sort of thing always depresses me, praying for the dead and all that. Mark if the dead are all right in their place, sir, but somehow the music and the candles always gives me the creeps. It does really, sir. I hate to be so fussy, sir. I... How about a trip up top, sir? That'd really put them off the scent. Careful there. I can't see. Hey, here, yeah. There you are, my boy. Oh. 
Oh, look, there it goes there. Well, I'll have to buy you another now. Oh, oh, oh. Duck. Careful, boys. You better be careful, too, sir. <laughs> Not yet, boys. Come on, we've seen it all. Let's get out of here. I have a luncheon date and plenty to do before. Well, I've got it in mind, sir. Don't you worry. Really, now, now, look. Look, isn't it worthwhile coming up here to see it, sir? Hey? Why, look, there's the Houses of Parliament over there. And there, there's St. James's Park. That green patch. Yeah. Come along, boys. You must excuse me getting so scared when you leaned over just now, sir. I was once with a man on a bridge in Switzerland. He had a very nasty fall. Killed him. Stone dead. Always made me a bit nervous since. Oh, don't go down just yet, sir. I'd like it to see some falls. There it is, they're just coming out of the mist. Oh, look, look, there's the horse guards approaching Buckingham Palace. See them? Well, it down makes there. the backs and the legs go funny. I'd always did. Let's get down again, Eric. We've only just come up. Why didn't you say so before? Excuse me, miss, I know just how you feel. Them as has no it for rights can't help it. Nobody ought not to blame them. And what you got to do with you, I'd like to know. All right, son, all right, keep your hair on. I was only sympathizing with the lady. I'm going down anyway. Well, wait for the lift. No. No stairs for me. I'm going to take the elevator. Oh, wait a minute, sir. You ain't seen the horse guards yet. Oh, you must see the horse guards, sir. Where? I don't see anything. Why, there they are, sir. Down the road. Just going toward the... the white building. for the grace of God. I still don't know what instinct made me step aside when he came at me. You need a drink. I heard the lift coming up and I turned. I saw that look in his eyes. He came toward me. In that split second, the whole thing flashed through my mind. All I could think of was Fisher. Fisher planned this. Then I guess I just stepped aside and over he went. Over he went, all right. Did you want that? No, thanks. When are you going to send the story in to our esteemed gazette? When I get ready. Well, there goes another one of my illusions. I thought you were one of those journalists that nothing could stop. Floods, smallpox, love, the story must go on. It'll go on. No. I can understand you're not wanting to drag Miss Fisher into it. Well, on the other hand, she's probably in it already. The mall of the gang. Why, you dirty... On second thought, I'm sure not. I'm sure she's a fine girl, upstanding, honest. A great soul. Well, I can't send the story over on Van Meer until he's safe. We've got to find Van Meer first. Ah, oh, there's our man now, probably. Mr. Van Meer, come in. Good morning, Stevens. How are you, Haverstock? Congratulations on your little set too with Roly. What do you know about Roly? Very little folly a dozen here. He probably even knows about Fisher. I was under Fisher a year ago. Mm -hmm. But that uh, fellow with the high neck sweater. Krug, he's new to me. Oh, you were on to him, too. I followed him to London. I thought you were cold on this story. Well, on the contrary, I've been doing what you might call a bit of noticing. Remember that tramp that you found asleep in the mill? Yeah. Well, he wasn't a tramp at all. He was Van Meer, I suppose. No, not quite, old boy. But I noticed him do a very strange thing for a tramp. He dirtied his hands with some of that nasty Dutch soil. I can't follow the workings of these masterminds. No, tell him it's ridiculous. You'd already disappeared, so I followed Krug, but ended up at the same old mousetrap. You mean Fisher? 
the good, a kind, a genial head of the peace party, Herr Fischer. Hello, Eddie. This is Plunger Stebbins. I want to place a little bet on Fliberty Gibbet in the first race. But the, the race is over. What do you know about that? Okay, I'll call you back later. I'd say any objection to working the rest of this thing together, have a stop, catch Fisher, find Van Meer and all that sort of thing? No, it's all right with me, but I'd like to know why they kidnapped Van Meer in the first place. Mm, yes, of course. Well, he was one of the signatories to a certain treaty. Now, the most important clause in that treaty was never written down. It was just memorized by the two people who signed the thing. I see. And they're going to beat it out of him, eh? Oh, well, they're going to try too hard enough, and I think it'd be a good idea if we put a stop to them. It contains a piece of information that would be very valuable to the enemy in the war that breaks out tomorrow, weather permitting. What? Well, why didn't somebody let me in on this? Come on, Stevens, we gotta get busy. Oh, plenty of time. Lunch first. You mind waiting a minute? You might be of some help. I thought up a little plan for forcing Fisher's hand. Let's have it. Well, I think the neatest thing we could do would be to kidnap Fisher's daughter. Oh, yeah? One of Fisher's few genuine traits is his affection for Miss Fisher. Easy, Folly, if you're speaking to the young man who loves her. Well, all the better. Give you a chance to get a bit chummy, Haverstock, and keep her out of this mess. Happy at your side while we batter away at old Papa. Now, this is my little scheme. I walk in and let Fisher know in a very nice way that his daughter's in the hands of someone who means business just as he means business when he kidnaps people, and I think you'll see things our way. Nothing doing. I thought you were a newspaper man, Haverstock. Well, that doesn't include kidnapping your fiancé where I come oh, from. It would if your country were at stake. Well, this isn't my country. Well, it's your story, and don't be so gloomy about it. As a matter of fact, she doesn't even have to know what you're doing. Just keep her amused for a few hours. Well, why not grab Fisher and have a showdown with him? That's no good. We've got nothing on Fisher, and he'd slip out of it anyway. He's been slipping out of it for years, and all we'd do would be to kill Van Meer. Mm. Hello, darling. Are you all right? What were you doing up there on the tower? Well, trying to keep out of harm's way, I thought. But, well, those assassins followed, and there was a scuffle, and over he went. That's all. Look, darling, they won't stop till they get you. You must leave London immediately. But listen, the one thing everybody forgets is that I'm a reporter, and there's a war. I can't run out on this war. You mustn't he, Scott? He can't stay here. Tell him how desperate these men are. He shouldn't stay here another minute. Why don't you take it somewhere? I won't go. Couldn't you think up some maiden aunt in the country or something? There's my Aunt Margaret at Harpenden. Please, Johnny, let me take you there. Well, how about it, Haverstone? You stay out of this. I'll decide for him. It's the only sensible thing to do. May I use your telephone? Hello, Stiles. Miss Carroll speaking. Would you tell Mr. Fisher that I'm driving down to my Aunt Margaret's at Harpenden? I don't care what your range. I won't I'll go. I'll be back in time for dinner. Thank you. There, it's all settled. We can get you a toothbrush. Tell you, Carol, it's no good. Oh, Johnny. I'm wondering whether this idea of your aunt is so good. Maybe it'd be better if you went further out, say, Cambridge. Oh, but there's no place as obscure as Harpenden. It isn't so much the place as the fact that Krug or someone who knows you might connect you with it. Maybe you're right. Let's make it Cambridge. All right. In the meantime, I'll phone your father so that he doesn't worry. Thank you, Scott. Please, Johnny. Well, that was a break, her walking in like that and suggesting they go to the country. Well, as a matter of fact, old boy, I suggested it to her on the phone about half an hour ago. Been a sign of anybody for the last 30 miles. What's the matter? Nothing. Well, you might at least talk to me. Really, it's unfair of you just to sit there and pout because I've kidnapped you from your so called duties. You've kidnapped me? Mm -hmm. Well, just remember that, will you? Well, please forgive me. Why, sure. Well, I don't think kidnapping's anything you get sore about when it's done with the right sort of kidnapper, do you? Not at all. Thanks. Hello? No, Mr. Fallot, I'm afraid he's not in yet. Very well, sir. Johnny, you don't love me. You're crazy. You looked unhappy when you kissed me. Never happier in my life. Won't do. Johnny, what's happening? Oh, I don't know. The war, I guess. They say it's coming tomorrow. Oh, so you've changed your philosophy since yesterday. There are more important things in the world than love. Well, I've got lots to do and important things. Yeah. I've got to get started. It'll take me three hours to get back. I'm not going to be misunderstood. I'm so in love with you, I'm going mad. Won't do. I suppose I can't be helped. You've turned European on me overnight, Johnny. That's unfair. I'm just as big a jackass as I ever was. Bigger. 
You're not going back to London to dinner tonight. You can't run out in your kidnapper like that. I mean, well, you know what I mean. Look, if you run out on me now, I'm going straight back to London and let them bump me off. Be a relief at that. Well, you are moody. Am I the cause of it? If you knew how much I loved you, you'd faint. What did I tell you? Come in. Uh, Mr. Ramstock? Yes? A call for you from London. We'll have him switch it out. I'm sorry, sir. There's only one phone here, and that's in the office. All right, I'll come down. Forgive me for a moment, dear. Just a moment, sir. Hello, is that you, Havistock, old boy? Are you alone? I mean, can you talk? Well, I can't get a hold of Fisher. He's been out all the afternoon. I'm afraid you'll have to keep the girl there much longer than we planned. Well, I don't know what time he'll be back, but I've got to catch him alone. I think you'd better keep the girl there for the rest of the night. But that's absolutely impossible. Well, we can't let this thing go now. Well, I can't very well explain, but I simply couldn't pull a thing like that. Well, you've simply got to try, old boy. There isn't anything else to be done. I'm counting on you. Hello? Hello? Are you quite satisfied with your room, sir? Well, not exactly. That is, I mean, yes. But what I really wanted was another room as well, a, a single room. Oh, Mr. Naismith. Mr. Naismith, uh, this gentleman wants another room. Is it for the young lady, and how long will you be requiring it? Well, uh, she'll only be here just the one night. The gentleman has number seven, sir. Well, what about number eight? Well, it doesn't really make any difference, so long as it's a good room, you know, windows and all that. I quite understand, sir. I think perhaps the uh, room next to yours would be best. It's quite a cozy room, isn't it, Miss uh, Pollock, number eight? They're all very much alike to me, sir. Eight'll do. Will you bring the young lady down to sign the book, please? Yes, I'll, uh, I'll get her. Good evening, sir. Thing, sir, that poor man who was here this morning. He has terrible stuff. My bag's all packed? Yes, sir. And Miss Carroll's, what about hers? Mrs. Stiles packed hers, too. She hopes she's put in the right thing, sir. It's been such a rush, especially with Miss Carroll not back yet. Well, sir, Mr. Forrest's here now. He's waiting in the sitting room. Another gentleman just phoned, but he wouldn't leave his name. I thought I recognized his voice as the foreign gentleman who was here at breakfast. Did he say telephone again? Yes, sir, he said it was most urgent. Well, uh, show Mr. Follett into the study. Sir? Well, Scott, sit down. I'm afraid you've caught me at a very busy moment. I'm getting ready to go back to America tomorrow on the clipper. Are you taking Carol with you? Yes, yeah, she doesn't know about it yet. It's been such a rush. I'm waiting for her to come in now. Well, Scott, what's your worry? Must be important by the number of times you telephone. Yes, it is rather, sir. It's about Carol. I'm afraid that, uh... What is it? Anything happened to her? No, sir, but I don't think you're going to be able to take her to America with you. What do you mean? Why not? Well, sir, I know it'll sound rather silly to you, but Carol has been kidnapped. Joke of some sort? No, sir. What do you mean, kidnapped? I happen to know she's with her hand in Harpenden. I'm afraid she isn't. Styles, who gave you the message that Miss Carroll had gone to her Aunt Margaret's? Miss Carroll herself, sir. Thank you, Styles. That's where she thought she was going. Give me half. 
Carpenden, 43422. Hello, is that you, Margaret? Is Carol with you? No. No, I... I wasn't certain. She said she might be running down to see you. I didn't know whether to expect her back for dinner. I... Good night, Margaret. No, she isn't there. What makes you say she's been kidnapped? Well, sir, I arranged it. <laughs> what if this has gone far enough? Where is Carol? Carol's being held as a sort of hostage. I see people who are very much in earnest, as much in earnest as you are. Don't be so cryptic, Scott. I've not the faintest idea what you're talking about. I want to know where you're hiding, Van Meer. So that's it. You've been talking with that young American, Haverstock. He was here this morning telling us something about Van Meer still being alive. Yes, and you promised Haverstock you'd look into it, didn't you? Naturally. Not an unusual way of looking into it, trying to have him put out of the way. Oh, I realize that a life or two is a small matter the way you work. Well, the people who have got Carol can take a leaf out of your book. Where is she? What have we done with her? Where's Van Meer? friend to talk if you come along yourself. I'm sorry to drag you here like this, but I think it's the only way if you want to leave tomorrow. When you get here, ask at the cashier's desk to use the phone. They'll show you straight up. Very well, I'll drop in as soon as I can. If you want Carol to go with you to America, sir, you'd better tell me where Van Meer is. Bring her back here and I'll give you the address. Carol can be home in three hours, but I want that address now. I give you my word you shall have it as soon as Carol is home. I can't possibly wait three hours. Besides, I uh, happen to want Van Meer alive. Scott, I delivered him all right. Oh, good. Well, sir, I think I'll be getting along now. Thanks very much for those points from my leader. Can I take them now? Good night, Carol. Good night, sir. Good night. I upset you, sir. I know. I'm being silly. I'm behaving perfectly stupidly. Please forgive me. I wouldn't mind so much, but I didn't think he was that sort of person. Something to do with young Haverstock. You like him very much, don't you? Well, after what happened today, I drove him down to the country to get him away from those people. I thought you were going to Aunt Margaret's. Well, we were, but Scott Foley had thought it would be better to go further away. So, I thought the College Arms at Cambridge would be a good place. When we got there, I found out that he wanted... Well, you see, we'd been joking about it. But when I heard him book the extra room, I knew he meant it. It's a cheap trick. That's what hurts it was so cheap. It wasn't at all like I thought it was. Well, what difference does it make? I don't care if I ever see him again. You won't have to, dear. We're going back to America tomorrow by Kipper. Tomorrow? Oh, but I can't. Well, I suppose I can, but why tomorrow? It's our last chance. War will probably be declared tomorrow. I have to get to Washington. The boats will all be crowded. We might have to wait two weeks for a passage. Oh, but, Father, what about Mr. Van Meer? Oh, I don't know how we could. I was at the Foreign Office with Ainsworth this afternoon. They're taking the whole thing over. Stars, what is it? It's the black outside. I have to draw the blinds. Oh, I forgot. All right, before you do that, order me a taxi, will you? Yes, sir. 
I've got a couple of people I must see before we leave. I'll try not to be long. Mrs. Stiles has done your packing. I thought we might go down to Southampton by car. We can stay overnight at the Southwestern. Stiles and my hat, please. Goodbye, Donnie. I'll be back as soon as I can. In the meantime, you and Stiles might be loading up the car so as not to lose any time. You better get something to eat. But what about you? I'm not hungry. I'll get a sandwich later. Two forty-two Charlotte Street, halfway up the Tottenham Court Road. Wait here until Haverstock turns up. He's bound to come here, and as soon as he arrives, bring him along to two forty-two Charlotte Street, off Tottenham Court Road. Hello. 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 Can I use your telephone? This way, sir. Where is he? In there. We can't make him say anything. I'm afraid it's up to you. Well, let's get it over. Is this place safe? There will be no interruption. We close it for decoration. What about those people downstairs? They won't make any trouble. They know what will happen to their relatives in the homeland if they do. I know, in the music of little Volker, but it serves its purpose. Yes. Can't you cut them down? Yeah. I thank you. Oh, I thank you very much. You're like my friend, Mr. Fisher. I'm sorry. It's just so dark. I can't tell. But you are so, so like my friend. I am Fisher, Mr. Van Rea. I am your friend. Oh, I'm so glad. Mr. Fisher, are the police here? Yeah? Oh, they mustn't get away. You must let these people go. Pardon me, gentlemen. I represent the Jupiter Life Assurance. Could I interest you in a small policy? Why did you bring him up here? I didn't know what to do. He tried to pass by. I would gladly relieve the young lady of this embarrassment, but you know how women are with firearms. They have no sense of timing. Now, look, I'll just sit here and you carry on with whatever you were doing. Don't mind me. I sometimes sit like this for hours. Oh, who's that? Is it the police? 
Oh, tell, tell me who I am. You are in London, Mr. Van Meer. So in London? Have I been here long? Oh, oh, you must send a telegram to my wife. Or oh, tell her that I'm safe with you. At least try to understand, Mr. Van Meer. The police are not here. I am here merely to talk to you. But these... these people... They think that I'm working with them. They don't know that I'm your friend. We must play a little game. It's a little game? Yes. They have asked me to get you to tell me what they are trying to find out. But I can't do that. You know that I can't. You can tell me, Mr. Van Meer. Just that one clause in the treaty. Clause 27. Clause 27. Come, Mr. Van Meer. But it's the, the secret clause. I know it. Clause 27. But they, they must know it. It would help them if they make war. Oh, Fisher, you don't want them help, do you? Of course not. Just let them see you carry it to me. It'll be enough. Just let them see you whisper it to me. I'll promise to keep it safe. He's not your friend, Mr. Van Meer. Don't tell him. Who was that? Someone just said you weren't my friend. Why didn't you bring the police? Why aren't you taking me away from here? Ah. Oh, you are not taking me away. Why? You are so... F Fisher. Fisher. Fisher, where are you? Help me. Help me, Fisher. Oh, yes. I see now, there's no help. No help for the whole poor, suffering world. Oh, you, you cried peace, Fisher. Peace, and there was no peace. Only war and death. You are a liar, Fisher. A cruel, cruel liar. Well, you can do what you want with me. That's not important. But you'll never conquer them, Fisher. Little people everywhere who give crabs to birds. Lie to them. Drive them. Whip them. Force them into war. When the beasts like you will devour each other, then the world will belong to the little people. We're wasting valuable time. Kurt. Think. Come on, Mr. Fisher. Oh, in the event of invasion by an enemy. Why, it's only a restaurant. Look! Come on! Just hurry, sir. Down the back stairs. Oh. 
Come on, Rex, Rex, let's go. Have some other way. I can say is you're a blithering idiot if you don't nab Fisher before he gets on that plane. Oh, don't be a fool. How can we arrest him without any evidence? Don't be so obstinate. Isn't Van Meer himself proof enough? No, he isn't, and you ought to know it. What proof is there against Fisher personally? All the conceited, stupid numbskulls. If you'd stop behaving like a boy scout and let us handle this, ask McKellar to come in here. Why don't you go and see Dr. Boniface? He's very good for nerves. Identification of Van Meer complete? Absolutely. Of course, he's still unconscious at the nursing home when they send him. But there's no doubt it's Van Meer. All right, you'd better get back there. Take somebody with you so that you can get a statement from him as soon as he comes to. In the meantime, send a man down to keep an eye on that flying boat and wait instructions from us. I say, what's the good of being related to Scotland Yard? I can't get that fool brother of mine up there to do anything. Scotland Yard can't solve my problem. Now, Scotland Yard's in there. Everybody but me. You're in it too, old boy, and you don't know it. Come on, we've got to get on that plane and keep an eye on Fisher. All now, right. listen, Stebbins, while we're driving down, I want you to ring up Mayfair 24574. Just a moment. Let me get it down. Mayfair 24574. That's my cousin Jeffrey Gwynne. He's the director of the airline. And tell him I've simply got to have two seats on the clipper for America tomorrow morning. You got that? Then go to the Hilton Nursing Home and stick by Van Meer. Then phone Miss Edith Armbruster, Kensington 66255 until I'm off to America. Will she dine with me next Monday instead of tomorrow and uh, sort of square it with her, will you, old boy? Sure, sure. And then call up Stevens at the post and uh, tell him that I'm off to America. Cable New York and tell him that I'm off to America. And then, then ring up the Curzon Dancing Academy and cancel my rumble list. Two ham sandwiches on rye bread. Well, there's no use my waiting around, then. I have several things It's hard to say how soon he'll recover. It may be some hours before he can speak. Well, frankly, Inspector, I don't know much about this, but my friend's on the clipper. I'll, I'll be in touch with the yard. Dr. Van Meer speaks. They'll send word to the plane. I say, did you hear the wireless? War Where's declared. War? Read all about it. Special war. War declared. War. It's war with Germany. War declared. England declared war with Germany. Makes you forget all about the war and troubles. It would be nice if we could just keep flying for a long time, live in the clouds. Yes, it would be very nice. But it's time for me to make a landing, a forced landing. What's the matter? Anything happen? Carol, I've got to talk to you. I don't want to, but I've got to. It's the hardest part of the whole thing, talking to you now. I don't mind about the rest, really. It's about Krugen. Van Meer. You guessed it. Not till last night. I've just been worried. But I believed in you. You shouldn't. It's true then, what I wouldn't believe. Yes. And to be arrested when we land. Oh. As a spy, shipped back to London. Father. That's quite all right, except just the one phase of it. You. That's why I've got to talk to you. I should like you to think of me a little from my own point of view. 
It might help you afterwards. First, about yourself. Am I deceiving you? I had to, you know. I didn't want you involved in any part of it because you're English, half English anyway. I'm not. I'm just coated with an English accent. It's a very thin coat. I fought for my country and my heart in a very difficult way. Because sometimes it's harder to fight dishonorably than nobly in the open. And I've used my country's methods because I was born with them. I don't intend making this sort of plea to the court martial. I'm making it only to my daughter, whom I've loved dearly, and before whom I feel a little ashamed. What you say to me now means much more to me than any other verdict. My dear. Stuart. Yes. This is not for me. I was mistaken. Listen, I'm not going to sit here for another 14 hours and play hide and seek with her. I'm going to talk to her and have it over with. I don't see that you could do any harm now that he knows we're on the plane. All right. Not a word in front of her, do you understand? I wouldn't dream of talking. What are you going to say to her? How do I know? I'm all mixed up. I'm in love with a girl and I'm going to help hang her father. I know I've got to say something or go crazy. <laughs> a little brandy make you feel better. You know it always makes me cry harder. Oh. Surprise. What are you doing here? Well, I'm just having myself a ride. Look, Carol, I've got to speak to you alone. It's very important. Do you mind, Mr. Fisher? Folly, it's with you, isn't it? In a way, yes. And you both after my father. You're going to have him arrested when we land, aren't you? I don't know what you're talking about. I never arrested anyone in my life. That's a lie. You've been following him from the beginning. That's why you wanted me out of the way yesterday at the inn. Pretended you loved me, tried to keep me overnight so you could... So it's a lie, that's all. Everything you've ever said to me have been lies. Hello, quite a reunion, isn't it? You too. Please, dear. Why don't you stay and have a drink, Scott? I'll be back in a moment. Where are you going? Well, oh, just to stretch my legs. By the way, I read that wireless you received was given me by mistake. Oh, that's all right, sir. You're not going unless I go with you. I know you both think my father's a traitor and a renegade. Well, he isn't. Not to me. Thanks. It's a minority report, but very welcome. Look, Carol, I've got nothing to do with spies or anything. I'm just a reporter, and I came here after a story. I'm sorry I ever heard of Van Meer, and I'd blow up the globe and cut Mr. Power's throat rather than to do anything to harm you. What is it? They've gone crazy. What do they think they're doing? Who are they? What is it? Call Bottom. Tell them they're being attacked. Oh! Oh. Sorry about this, Follett. I assure you it has nothing to do with me. We're coming down. You're the most amazing, cool-headed woman I've ever seen. Make for the wind is. Right. Here you are. Put these on. They're changing. Can you come out, sir? They're all going nuts in there. All right, Stokes, I'll be out immediately. Yes, sir. What the devil am I going to say, Stanley? This isn't like bad weather. Tell them it's a mistake, that it's target practice. Oh, I know it's foolish for me to ask you to be calm, but we're doing the best we can. I should keep away from that window, so it might be dangerous. Why don't you sit back? I'm not going to put this on. What are they firing at? I never heard of anything so stupid. I shall see the British Consul as soon as I leave. Oh, she's gone. What in the name of heaven are they doing? Switch off the gas. You've got the other port motor. But they cut up the other starboard motor. Come down on two. Right. It's a German, the Von Scheer. She says she's sorry, but she thought we were Obama. She's steaming to our rescue straight away. Oh, the wings go off. <laughs> Let me get out. Come away from that door. We're crazy to stay here. When she hits the water, the tail's going to be the best place. You're right, Carl. Let's get back there. Come on.
I've seen on here. She's going under. Quick, under the wing. The enemy coming to pick us up. Is it the enemy? We're all right. She's American. American ship Mohican picked us all up, taking us back to London. No, I can't tell you what happened. We're not allowed to give out anything. I'll wire you from London in a couple of days. Bye, Franklin. I say, this is a bit awkward, Haverstock. I've just been having a dirty row with the captain. The fellow insists on acting the true blue neutral. Enemy waters, he says, not a line to the press from his silly ship. Can't send out any stories, do huh? oh, We're going to use the wireless telephone for private messages. Hello, Aunt Effie. Safe aboard the Mohican. Feeling tip-top. <laughs> I ask you, Haverstock, two days before we get to London, we get scooped on our own story. Why don't you have a crack at brass buttons? No, what's the use? Even if he says OK, what good'll it do me? My hands are tied. What are you talking about? Carol. Oh. I came 4,000 miles to get a story. I get shot at like a duck in a shooting gallery. I get pushed off buildings. I get the story, and then I got to shut up. <laughs> what are you grinning at? I'm sincere. I'm not going to throw her father up for grabs. I don't care how he lived. He died like a hero to save her and the rest of us. Thank you. I guess I'm talking through my hat. Anyway, the whole point of it is he was her father. And I'm not going to play Judas to the only girl I I'm ever... I'm glad you said that. Very glad. Are you all dry and everything? You all right? I'm all right. Johnny, I want you to send it the whole story. Now, we'll talk about that later. No, please. I don't want you to feel that way about it. You can't help me by protecting my father. Listen, I'm in love with you. I can't hit you over the head with a scandal for a wedding person. Johnny, my father fought for his country his way. It wasn't a straight way, but it was a hard way. And I've got to fight for my country a hard way. OK, if that's the way you feel about it. I guess that's for me. I put in a call to my uncle, Uncle Powers. Hello? Hello? Johnny Jones on the wire. He's calling from the Mohican. What the deuce is he doing there? Wait a minute. Johnny wouldn't call up if it wasn't a story. Listen, tell him to hold the presses. Send Bradley in here. Tell him we're breaking up page one. Hello? 
Hello, Mr. Powers. This is Johnny Jones. Easy, old boy. Here comes the captain. Mr. Powers, keep your ear glued to this phone. And don't hang up. Mr. Haversack, I want to talk with you. Yes, sir. I just found out you're a newspaper man. I guess that's right. Oh, it is, huh? Why didn't you tell me that when I questioned you? You lied to me, sir. My dear captain, when you've been shot down in a British plane by a German destroyer 300 miles off the coast of England, latitude 45, and have been hanging onto a half-submerged wing for hours, waiting to drown with half a dozen other stricken human beings, you're liable to forget your newspaper man for a moment or two. Young man, you're going to have to forget it for longer than that. For as long as you're on this ship. I can't understand your attitude, sir. You performed a heroic rescue. Captain John Martin, you took us all out of the sea. You're not sending anything from this ship. That's final. You're absolutely right, Captain. We mustn't do anything to embarrass the United States government. Exactly. That's my point. Anyway, that's the story I've got. If you don't want me to print it, OK. But I think you ought to hear it first. Oh, that's only fair, Captain. You know who the head of that movement was in London? Mr. Stephen Fisher. What? You mean the man who ran the Universal Peace Party? Why, that's preposterous. Yes, the same Mr. Fisher who was drowned a few hours ago. He was using the Peace Party as a cover-up for spies and traitors. He was going to be arrested as soon as we landed and sent back to England. Those are facts. Well, I, I can't believe it, old boy. He was a friend of mine. The same Stephen Fisher who engineered the kidnapping of Van Meer, the Dutch diplomat. You don't expect anybody to believe that, young man. It's the truth. I refuse well, but to... But, my dear Captain, wait a minute. I think this young lady should know whether my friend is speaking the truth about Mr. Fisher. Yes, I ought to know. Mr. Fisher was my father. And I want the story printed. What's that? Oh, oh I guess that's my uncle. Uh, hello. Oh, hello, Uncle. How are you? Uh, how's Aunt Sadie? Well, I'm, I'm all right, thanks. We had a little accident, but uh, I, I can't tell you about it now. I'll, I'll tell you later. I'll write you. Yes, I, I'm going back to Europe. Uh, I was just wondering if you had any instructions for me. Yeah, keep on the job. Have you got all that down? Rush it out at once. This is London. We have as a guest tonight one of the soldiers of the press, one of the little army of historians who are writing history from beside the cannon's mouth, the foreign correspondent of the New York Globe, Huntley Haverstock. Hello, America. I've been watching a part of the world being blown to pieces, a part of the world as nice as Vermont and Ohio and Virginia and California and Illinois lies ripped up and bleeding like a steer in a slaughterhouse. And I've seen things that make the history of the savages read like Pollyanna legends. I've seen rain. Women. We shall have to postpone the broadcast. Oh, postpone nothing. Let's go on as long as we can. Madam, we have a shelter downstairs. How about it, Carol? They're listening in America, John. OK. We'll tell them. I can't read the rest of the speech I have because the lights have gone out, so I'll just have to talk off the cuff. All that noise you hear isn't static. It's death coming to London. Yes, they're coming here now. You can hear the bombs falling on the streets and the homes. Don't tune me out. Hang on a while. This is a big story, and you're part of it. It's too late to do anything here now except stand in the dark and let them come. It's as if the lights were all out everywhere, except in America. Keep those lights burning. Cover them with steel. Ring them with guns. Build a canopy of battleships and bombing planes around them. Hello, America. Hang on to your lights. They're the only lights left in the world. 